That night, the exile Orelek returned to the Commonwealth. He was to be the last. The stars had faded, and the cycle of the rites had run its course. He found the Commonwealth in great upheaval. Spurred by the efforts of six liberated exiles, Wilfred Sandalwood's revolutionary plan had incited the masses. These exiles in the starless sky portended the return of the scribes. The people surged into the streets shoulder to shoulder. Led by the six exiles, their voices shook the heavens. The leadership of the Commonwealth panicked. No blood was shed that night, and by dawn, it was over. The leaders of the Commonwealth had cast themselves back into exile, or joined in this new cause. Thus, in its 838th year, the Commonwealth had fallen. The new Saurian Union declared its sovereignty in the next year. Among the changes its elected leaders ushered in, they vowed never to cast their people into exile and they abolished the old Commonwealth decree of forbidding literacy. Today we still remember all of this. And we remember the exiles of the downside whose deeds led to the dawning of our age, whether they returned or not. Achievement unlocked true freedom. What is this? I have no idea. Um... After the cycle of the right ceased turning, records of what happened to the Black Wagon of the Nightwings became inconclusive and contradictory. Some, accounts, some accounts suggest that the night, exiles of the Nightwings who remained in the downside continued to make use of the Black Wagon as their place of shelter and their means of travel. However, there is no rac record of what happened to the wagon's contents, such as the Book of Rites, or the Beyonder Crystal said to be haunted by the apparition Sandra the Unseeing. One possibility is, when the lone minstrel took his leave, he took the Beyonder Crystal with him, for he was thus obliged. By this line of reasoning, however, the Black Wagon itself should have been taken also. Others remain skeptical that the Beyonder Crystal ever existed or rather that the visions that it granted were anything other than the results of an act of imagination or a fever dream. The bog dwellers of the southern bogs offer still another explanation, for they are familiar with binding enchantments. If there existed such an object in which the Sisters of the Arch had been expelled for more than 800 years, then the enchantment could have expired along with the light of the stars. What this would have meant for Sandra and the Beyonders is difficult to say for certain, other than, it may have meant they were finally released. Nevertheless, the fates of Sandra and the Beyonder Crystals remain unknown. Yet those exiles of the Nightwings who claim to have seen this apparition all spoke of her with degrees of reverence, or perhaps a little fear. Oh wow. This is gonna be a lot. <laughs> Let's alternate yeah. between. The imp called Tizo was the first of his kind to achieve liberty through the right. While he was not the only imp trained in the ways of the scribes, imps are native to the downside and thus care not for traveling abroad. This made them useful to triumph. Yet, Tizo had a different calling, and the Nightwings believed that he, too, could play a key part in Wolford Sandalwood's. During the night of the scribes' return, he stood out to the, po to the populace as something of a miracle. They had only heard of downside imps before from legends of how the Afterwards, he became something of an icon, representing both the fall of the Commonwealth and the beginning of a new era. He would visit his friend Ray at every opportunity. She was among the few who could constant, consistently interpret what he meant, and they were always close since first. Sandal would sometimes call for his assistance, and Tizo was always happy to oblige. The two would often reminisce about their times with the lone minstrel. Tizo often missed his interactions with the reader of the Nightwings. They had quickly built quite a rapper back in the down. He and Orlek reconciled as well. Orlek offered him free room and board, and that was that. Tizo liked writing on his shoulder. Aww. Aww. 
And Tizo would often express wistful gratitude for all, time, all his time conducting the rites alongside the Nightwings, who made such sacrifices for him. Other than that, Tizo was diligent about his role as something of a living artifact, and helped interpret for the messenger imps that relayed news to and from the down. Despite having gained significant celebrity, he never let it go to his head. Although, he did take full advantage of his access, of his access to the Sar Sarian Union's fishing industry. <laughs> After his liberation, Hedwin was instrumental in the events leading to the fall of the Commonwealth, and was vital to the outcome of the plan. The peaceful outcome of the scribe's return was attributed to several key factors. One of them was the underlying ambition of the plan itself. Another was Hedwin's visibility among the people in the streets. Identified to be a liberated exile, he was believed to be Gol Golothinian reborn. More importantly, however, was that one of the winged harps of the High Wing remnants accompanied him. She was later identified as Fikini Shang. Their bond was symbolic of what was at stake that night and proved vital to the peace that followed. In all his days as a leader in the Sarian Union, Hedwin oft confided in his friend Jadariel. Despite her intense manner, there was no one whom he trusted more in times when circumspection was required. Hedwin would often think back about the vow he made at the beginning of his quest for freedom. Although he cherished all the friendships he made, he had pledged to Jadario Ruki Greentail and the reader of the Nightwings that they might all be free again together. He had broken that vow, for in the end not all of them were able to return. A terrible guilt over this darkened his mood for a time. However, the others whom he still knew lifted his spirits, much like he had often lifted theirs. All the eight Nightwings knew the stakes. While the others who stood with the Nightwings were not all able to remain in contact thus, Hedwin thought of each of them often, and so in turn did they oft think of him. As the cycle of the rights drew to a click, it grew evident that a chance at freedom from the downside had forever slipped from Dalbert and Almer Oldheart's grasp. Thus, they and the Exiles of the Fate returned to Jomura Valley. There they struggled to get by as Exiles of the Downside tend Sometime after the rites had ended, the Old Hearts at last heard the news that the Commonwealth had fallen. This was well after the fact, of course, but it brought Old Dalbert great joy. Despite his forthright manner, he had no li love for the nation that cast him down alongside Man, I'm gonna be super mad if the reason they got cast down in here is because Almer's a savage and Dalbert had the audacity to adopt him. <laughs> Dalbert or had passed peacefully in his sleep before the next new moon. <laughs> Why do you have to do that game? <laughs> In his final days, he implored his son to undertake a pilgrimage to the scribes. Almer never shared his father's view of the scribes, but respected Dalbert's wishes. And so, after a period of mourning, Almer began a new Not a day went by that Almer Oldheart did not think of, the, of his father, and gave thanks to him, and speak to him at mourning and at- Oh, so hey, guys, want this to be even more painful? I told this to uh, Kanetsu and Kime in our group, but apparently if you lose a uh, a liberation right against this group, Dalbert will give up his position as the Anointed One to Almer so that he can return to the Commonwealth. <sighs> he, too, he, he was too nice. What have the stars yet shown? For surely Delberts would be there among them, smiling down at his son and watching over him and After the final liberation rite, Lindell refused to believe that the rites had truly ended. He would sit through night after consecutive night, staring into the blackness of the sky, awaiting any kind of sign that he might gain another chance at freedom. No such sign ever came. His fellow accusers started to express concern for him. Survival had become their top priority once liberty had slipped from their grasp. But Lendl dismissed them as weak fools. 
He insisted, rather forcefully, that any evening now the stars would shine for him again, and mark the way toward his inevitable freedom. He was, of course, mistaken. The others in his triumvirate were left with little choice but to abandon him. After that, the exile known as Lendl the Liar was never seen again. However, there have since been sightings of a bedraggled demon who wanders the downside and bears Lendl's cruel countenance, suggesting he yet lives. The Warm Knight Sir Gilman had elected to go into exile as penance for his failure to uphold his military obligations to the con. To him, earning back his freedom was tantamount to erasing the shame of his past. His honor was at stake more so than any. Yet, when it became clear to him that he would not go free again through the rites, he readily accepted the outcome, for he knew by then that that, that much more was on the He regretted not having a chance to contribute directly to the events that transpired in the Commonwealth, though he was pleased to hear the outcome. The conclusion of the rites and the fall of the Commonwealth made clear to him that his days as a knight had ended. He declared to all those in earshot that he would never fight again. Unless, of course, there arose some other extraordinary set of circumstances. Stance, again requiring him to fight, but he certainly hoped not. He still trained regularly, though never found as skilled and motivating of a partner as his fleet-footed friend, Rookie Greentail, whom he remembered fondly. From time to time, he would seek guidance from one of his former comrades, Big Bertrude, much his elder, and a wellspring of perspective on his life decision. He was always grateful for the counsel of the reader, and would reg regal them? Regale. Over and over. Oh, regale. Mm -hmm. Over and over, about the time they squashed the spawn of unfathomed plurn. He wasted no time dwelling on his days under the leadership of Sir Deluge, his former commander. The other Worm Knight stayed well clear of him. Gilman never did return to his homeland of the Sea Dominion, and was content to lead a mon monastic life on a small residence in the It was just high up enough to make him keep striving to conquer his fear of heights. Aww. Aww, I'm proud of you. Other than that, an intense daily training regimen, and the occasional visit from an old companion was more than enough to keep him optimistic and engaged. He knew by then that honor was not something to be won, but a contract with oneself, to be renewed each All his life, Sir Deluge had fled from one danger, only to find himself facing another. He had escaped the worn torn waters of the Sea Dominion, he had escaped the blood border of the Commonwealth, and now he had escaped the rites. After the rites had ended, many exiles wrapped up in the ancient test were crestfallen, as their last chances to return to their homes vanished, along with the stars above. But the luge did not mind, for this outcome meant that, at last, there was no burden of responsibility weighing down on him. Having heard that Sir Gilman had also remained behind, the luge made a point of avoiding him at all costs. Nonetheless, they ran into each other, once, riding a cold current in the Sea of Solace. The meeting was terse and cordial. Deluge ended up apologizing profusely for mistreating his fellow Worm Knight, and that was the end of it. While most of his fellow exiles of the Pyre Hearts yet longed for the waters of the Sea Dominion, driven as ever by their impulses towards conflict, Deluge settled down. With him remained one of his companions, one Lady Seagrass who had taken a liking to him for some unfathomable reason. <laughs> I hadn't even finished reading the line, I just added that as an ad lib. <laughs> Reportedly, they disappeared into the waters of Wormgold, which began to explain the significant increase in worm population observed in the vicinity. <laughs> well then... <laughs> After the cycle of the rites had it seized, Witch Oudmild returned to the Flagging Hands region where she sealed herself within the pit of Mel- or Melith. There, even her fellow exiles of the Withdrawn allegedly grew unnerved after a time and left her to her vile world. Sometime later, the pit of Melith erupted into flame. So intense was the conflagration. Conflagration. Wow. Confl. Con. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, just because she's staring at you like that. She, she can't reach you, Kanetsu. <laughs> 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 conflagration that it could be seen all the way from Jomura Valley. 
Arson was suspected, though the cause was never verified, and many bog dwellers in the region were forced to... A tempest blowing from the north finally quenched the flames. When at last the ashes settled and the grounds had cooled, the side of the fire was scarred beyond recognition. No trace of which would meals could be... So she did. As for the cause of the Pit of Melith, which notably included a profane object thought to be the remains of Yislak, all of it was gone as well. Back in the Asarian Union, Udmild's repeated threats of the return of Islak were thoroughly investigated, and no credence was found to any of her- Oh, boy. That's a lot of characters. <laughs> Barker Ashpaws never had much interest in returning to the Commonwealth, for he always found its bylaws to be stifling, so when the rights ended, he did not care at first. He soon grew very bored. The rights had given his life a certain sense of structure he had always needed. He missed the raw anticipation of it all. He decided to continue conducting the rites for the thrill of it. He bent some of the rules and replaced some of the objects, but it was close enough. His packmates, the dis dissidents, proved more than happy to participate, and thus they ran against each other back in Jomer Valley. Gradually, other exiles familiar with the rites, as well as those who had not heard of it at all, started to take an interest. They ended up giving Barker Ashpaws some healthy competition. His old feud with Rookie Greentail ceased meaning anything to him, and he forgot all about it amid his new pursuits. Ultimately, even Barker Ashpaws, who had led such a directionless existence to that point, found something of a calling through the rites. Whether he took the rites less seriously than any of other exile of his time, or more, was oft debated by those who watched him work. After Rookie Greentail earned back his freedom, he returned to a lavish welcome ceremony in the Commonwealth, and was, as was the tendency for liberated. It was everything he could have hoped for, and soon he was well off, surrounded by luxury, and choosing between various exciting opportunities. However, he must have given in to his better judgment, as he did end up siding with Wolfred Sandalwood's revolutionary forces, as he promised. On the night of the scribe's return, Greentail was there with the others, inspiring the masses. He never looked prouder, the very image of Jomor Many Mane himself. When dawn finally came and it became clear that the Commonwealth that everybody knew would be no more, he realized many new opportunities awaited. He began quite a lucrative career for himself, manufacturing and selling replica merchandise inspired by the downside. His main struggle was to meet demand. An aspect of his conscience cautioned him against making light of such a thing, but the money was too good and soon his family was as well off as he always said. Greentail always did his best to keep in touch with all his many friends and knew that he owed his fortunes to he made a special point of staying close with the group of friends he came to know so well during his time with the Nightwings, wherever they were. They shared a special understanding that put even Greentail at a loss for words sometimes. Oh. The Commonwealth had never provided a sense of home for the one they had called Ray the Wretched, so she was surprised on her return that she was so well treated. She felt uneasy about it, and besides, she knew that she would do her best to fulfill the pledge she had made to her friend. Even she could not have expected the impact she would have on the events that followed, which gave rise to our Saurian Union. Despite not fitting the image of any of the eight scribes, Ray nonetheless stood out alongside the others, amid the teeming masses on the nights of Scribes' return. Inspired by the liberated exiles, the people of the Commonwealth demanded new leadership. Cast yourself down, cast yourself down. Chant from the scribes' return. She spoke of the scribes with such conviction and sincerity that the crowd was very moved. After the fall of the Commonwealth, there was a renewed interest in the legend of the eight scribes and many new interpretations of their histories and teachings. Ray found herself at the center of all this. Her way of speaking continued to compel a growing audience. She swayed many people from their astralist beliefs. Soon the Eighth Word, a theocratic sect believing that the Eighth Scribes were more than mortal and their words divine. Sure, a book created by the Scribes was more than a fable but a genuine artifact, though perhaps lost to time. 
Soon the eighth word, which had lost favor with the people during the reign of the Commonwealth, sought her out and asked her to formally join, and she did right away. Among her friends, she always remained close to with Diesel, who, more so than anyone, could always make her laugh. She cited her relationship with Jadario as the single most important in her life. Jadario would always provide for her a circumspect perspective and the wisdom of experience. Ray always was devoted to her faith, but more so to her friends. Many people in the Saurian Union cited that her gentle manner and unwavering conviction helped them brave the changing times with courage and with grace. Throughout her exile, Tama the Thane was motivated by a single goal, to return to the Commonwealth and exact vengeance on her ancient enemy. When she realized the rites had ended and that she would never see her mountain home again, she nonetheless remained determined to aid her people however possible. She had gathered certain information pertaining to the intentions of the Nightwings, who had formed a pact to regroup on the other side after their liberation. Other such reports exposed certain weaknesses in the Commonwealth defenses and revealed to the High Wing remnants the opportunity for a risky but potentially impactful strike. As Tamitha could not participate in the assault, she learned what happened well after the outcome. On that night, known as the Scribe's Return, the Commonwealth had fallen. The Highwing remnants thus prevailed at last without even having to Soon after the fall of the Commonwealth, Tamitha encountered her blood sister Pamitha, come, come to pay her a Pamitha had hoped their people's victory on the other side would be cause for reconciliation. Tamitha was skeptical of her intentions, however, and lashed out at Pamatha made no attempt to elude the attack and was struck full on. This cost Pamatha the use of her right wing, yet after she recovered, she shrugged the incident aside and said maybe they could would call it even. Uh. From that point on, the Blood Scissors kept a formal distance, but were cordial with each other. Knowing that the conflict on the other side had ended, Tamatha retreated to the crags of Black Basin and grew ever more those closest to her surmised that her inability to reconcile with her blood sister was at the heart of this, though for her part, Tamitha never once admitted to any such weak. When Manly Tinderstoff realized the rites had ended and that he no longer could return to the Commonwealth through this ancient means, he was outraged. He cursed the scribes, spewing forth such a slew of blasphemy as to be very unbecoming of one of his high status and bearing. When at last he calmed himself, he focused all his energies on attempting to find another means of homecoming. He maintained regular contact with his wealthy family on the other side via messenger imp, and used their vast resources to explore other means of escape. He tried using an elaborate pulley system. He attempted to retrofit a flying black wagon of superior propulsion. He tried an imp raft, a hot air balloon, even prayer. Oh god. <laughs> Nothing worked. It was only one way to escape the downside, and now it was gone. Tinderstoff bankrupted his family in th these vain attempts. At last, such was his shame that he retreated to the teeming woods of Black Basin, to Cinder Root. There he yet wallowed, complaining to his comrades of the chastity who still put up with him, either about his own misfortune or the latest news from the other side. After the rites ended, Pemetha Thane parted ways with the other Nightwings, stating that she needed time alone. She reappeared sometime after the fall of the Commonwealth, although she expressed mild surprise at the news. She claimed to have no knowledge of what went on, including what role the High Wing remnants had in the events that reshaped the world on the other side. For her part, Pamatha feigned little interest, making the point that they were stuck, and what happened elsewhere had little to do with them. Someone with whom she kept in contact was a bog dweller called Big Bertrude. They would discuss all sorts of matters long into the night and sometimes hunt together. One day, while traveling to Black Basin, Pamatha ran into her blood sister Tamatha for the first time since the conclusion of the wreck. The reunion was not as amicable as Pamatha might have hoped, and Tamatha, still resentful of their history together, turned from Pamatha would later brush aside the incident, though always had an injury to show for it. Yet, from that point on, the Blood Sisters were back on speaking terms, at least for the most part. 
Having long since felt as though she had no home to call her own, Pamela continued traveling about the downs. As a tempest swept across the land, changing its features, she found in it a sublime beauty, and in the starless nights, she still could see just... She said that such travels tended to remind her of when she was younger, and could fly unfettered. After her liberation, Jadario soon became an icon of the movement that led to the collapse of the Commonwealth and the rise of the Saurian Union. Her horns and stern countenance inspired the people to believe that she was Solium Mer reborn. She became a great, if reluctant, leader. In the uncertain times that followed, Jadario's seasoned expertise often came into play, both in matters of security and, in, and of state. For instance, she conscripted and trained a team of volunteers in public safety. The community did not know what to make of such a cordial bunch at first, but soon came to value their service. They have stood for the people ever since, and we celebrate their founding day each year. She reigned close with Hedwin all through this experience, and they supported each other through their struggles many, many times. She kept an eye on Rey, who, nonetheless, demonstrated a surprising knack to get by on her own. The Jadara was always willing to provide assistance, just in case. She never settled down with anyone, although from time to time she thought about Ignarius despite herself. She continued training on her own, a, a regimen that grew stricter with each passing year. There were those who sought to train with her, and she sometimes obliged. There remained one other constant in her life. She would always remember her days among the Nightwings, and with fondness for the most part. Several exiles of the Nightwings cared more for the plan of Sandalwood than to return home from the downside. The crone called Big Bertrude was a prime example. She had found a suitable environment to live within the dismal region known as Flagging Hands. There, she had built up a thriving place of business known to many exiles in the with the rights having ended, she returned to preoccupations, working away, almost as though nothing had happened. When no one gets to be more than 400 years of age, perhaps then even mon monumental events such as the culmination of the rights or the collapse of the Commonwealth are seen as trifling matters. Much of her elf effort was doubtless due to the influence of Sandalwood, someone whom she had admired now for decades. Though they were very far apart now, she sought out news as to his whereabouts and found his actions in the Sa Saurian Union a rare source of inspiration. She maintained an unlikely kinship with the Harp, Pamitha Thane, whom she had known during their time together on the Nightwing. They ha each had different strategies for dealing with life's day-to-day -day annoyances, a subject that they both found vital, if not fascinating, to know. By and large, Bertrude kept focus on her work. Whether casting small enchantments or imbuing talismans, the work brought her a sense of purpose. She in the Commonwealth, such services were strictly forbidden, but in the downside, there was a real need for simple, simple luxuries, which the competing slug market could not always provide. Thus did Big Bertrude continue to live up to her name, and the tales of her days with the Nightwings made her that much more the living land. Once it became clear to Ignarius that the rites were drawing to a close, he knew that it was time for him and the Tempers to call it quits. But first he and the Tempers decided to celebrate, and that they did, for many, many nights. The revelry ev did eventually subside. The exiles parted amicably and went their separate ways. He roamed the downside then, searching for some meaning in his life, something, sometimes taking odd jobs requiring his brute strength. He never remained alone for very long, and took on many lovers in his time. However, he sometimes thought about the one he called Curly Hearns and what became of her. Though his glory days as the most powerful conductor of the rites had long since passed, he always enjoyed the fearsome reputation he had cultivated at that time. <laughs> With the rites drawn to a close, the slug market's revenues fell precipitously. I think Precipit so. that, and Falcon Ron was forced to liquidate his assets and close up shop. Yet, as is sometimes the case with those of an entrep wow, entrepreneur, 
entrepreneurial leaning, this time of hardship led to an epiphany, or at least a sudden change of fortune. One day, Falcon and Ron had a run-in with a messenger imp bearing news from the other side. Ron gave it to one of his remaining trinkets, which could not be The following week, the messenger imp returned to him bearing a tidy sum of wealth in newly minted coinage from the Saurian Falcon and Ron cut a long-term deal with the messenger imp, then in Though his trade remained a gray area from a legal standpoint in the Saurian Union, or Saurian Union, the newfound fame of the downside caused Falcon Ron's goods to explode in popularity. He later signed an elaborate agreement with Big Bertrudes and found a distribution distribution partner on the other side through Rookie Greentail, whose own business had expanded. Especially in the Saurian Union, Falcon Ron's goods are still known for their superior quality, though he assumes no liability for any side. Like negative five hope. <laughs> In the aftermath of the final liberation rite, Orelek at last returned to his nation, one he had not seen in nearly two decades. He scarce recognized it. After all, it was in the midst of transformation, a social and cultural upheaval sparked by Wolfred Sandalwood's plan. When Orelek witnessed the people of the Commonwealth standing shoulder to shoulder and chanting together on the night of Scribe's return, he looked on in silence for a time. Then he stepped toward the crowd. A murmur and hush moved through the gathered citizens at the sight of him, for they had never seen someone thus changed by the downside. But then Orlek raised his voice with theirs, and they all stood united once again. History would know him as the Demon Doctor, a term of endearment that struck, stuck even after his horns started to recede. He lent his skill and service throughout the birth of the Saurian Union. The one he had called the Shadow of the False Nightwings was somehow someone whom he thought of often. He knew he owed his freedom to them. In light of having witnessed the aftermath of Sandalwood's plan, Orelek sought out his former companion. While they kept private the details of the conversation that took place, it must have been enough to rebuild the bonds of friendship between the two of them. They were often seen together after that. Orelek later reunited with Tiso, who took residence with him in some ways similar to how they lived in olden times. The imp always enjoyed his company. Alone with his thoughts, Orelek would sometimes visit the memorial to the falling leaders of the Commonwealth. Though, other than such appearances, and notwithstanding his duties as a master physician of the state, Orelek led a very private life. Few would have guessed that he once was one of the most accomplished rights conductors in the history of the Nightwings. History, of course, shall ensure we shall never forget. When Wolfred Sandalwood regained his freedom, he knew that his work had only... The nation that had exiled him to life in the downside now prepared to honor him. But he was not interested in such ceremony, nor in freedom on the Commonwealth's own terms. He soon rejoined his agents, with whom he had been coordinating for years, slowly, carefully preparing for a night that soon. For Sandalwood and his loyalists and sympathizers, true freedom was at stake. Not just theirs, but that of everyone living under the common. He hoped to gather liberated exiles representing each of the eight largest ethnic groups composing the population of the common. They would stand together as a vision of the eight scribes returned, inspiring the masses to embrace an older set of values from before the Commonwealth had tightened it. With the rites having ended sooner than expected, this optimal scenario became impossible. But Sandalwood did not relent and prepared to execute his plan, imperfect though it was. On the night of the scribes' return, he stood as one of six former exiles of the Nightwings, and their voices echoed together through the street. These former exiles, who ought to have disappeared into the ranks of the Commonwealth's own leadership, now stood united with its people who poured from their homes in solidarity. It was imperative to Sandalwood that this stand against the Commonwealth be peaceful in its nature. An overwhelming show of popular support would be more than that. Ensuring that this was his priority that night, and in the end, the result was self-evident. The plan's goal had been achieved. 
Sanawa's work was far from over, still. He labored ceaselessly with representatives from across the population to restore a sense of stability. This transitional period had its troubles, though none that were not quickly solved. Such was the will and spirit of the people. They understood their freedom carried new responsibilities. After the Sari, Sandalwood was elected as the nation's first prime minister. It was not his intent to run for this office, but the people chose him anyway. He led our fledgling nation through its na nascent years? Nascent? Nascent. Nascent years. One of his allies in all of this was the imp, Tiso, with whom he traveled all across the downs. Sanawood often cited Tiso as the wellspring of his own enthusiasm for a brighter future. Such was the creature's spirit. He evidently made amends with his old one-time friend, Orlik, with whom he clashed during their days as exile. Orlik was instated as the nation's chief physician and became a close confidant. As Wolfram Sanderwood gained more fame throughout this land for all his sacrifices and his contributions, he remained ever steadfast about two things. The first was that the cause itself ought to remain in focus, the freedom that the people had achieved. It was a gift to be cherished, a set of values that needed to be nurtured. The second point he made was that he himself had little to do with the outcome. He would often praise the exiles of the Nightwings who had stood with him, each in turn, by name. He never forgot any of them. One day, on his birthday, the people of the Saurian Union presented to him a monument depicting him and the Nightwings as imagined in their It has since ensured that those of us with memories more fallible than that of Sandalwood likewise remember the achievements of his fellow former exiles and are After the cycle of the right seas turning, the lone minstrel bade the remaining Nightwings take bade the remaining Nightwings take in the Black Wagon and seek their fortunes elsewhere in the downside. Their parting was heartfelt, but brief. He remained there at the summit of Mount Elodio with Celeste, where the two of them would chronicle the final outcome of the cycle. Neither Tariq nor Celeste were ever seen again. We know all this now through song attributed to them. Some claim these songs originated in the taverns of the Sarian Union, and merely were imbued with weight of folklore. However, exiles liberated from the downside corroborated each other's claims at having met this duel that presided over the liberation rites. Another folktale suggests these minstrels were heralds of the scribes, having fulfilled their obligations they departed the world we know and rejoined their patrons. One of their famous songs describes another, simpler outcome. The two gave up their duties to their rights in favor of a life they could share together. In any cause, they are likely to remain the subject of such verses and such songs, for it was they who watched over the rights and ushered in our times. There is one more account which warrants mention. The Nightwings conducted the rites under the guidance of a reader. Little is known of them. However, some accounts of them began to paint a picture. We know they were of common birth, just stout enough to make a simple farmer. The journey to the downside left them close to death. It was then that the Nightwings found them. They brought them from the brink. They showed them the path. They pressed onward with the others. They made a vow to help their friends to be free. Thus did the cycle of rights commence its final turns. When the final rites arrived, the reader's freedom was at stake. In the end, however, they remained in exile. From that point on, accounts of them diverge. It is said the voice which troubled them, they never heard again. Some say they sailed across the Sea of Solace. Though whether that is true, only they know. Someday, perhaps that reader's own star shall emerge. Then it shall pierce the dark of the night in all its brilliant glory. Until such a time, and after, ever after, all of us give thanks. Another song playing, so we just let it, I'll let it finish out.
Bog dweller Gertrude kept their foes at bay with her finest enchantments. She remained till the end. The reader at last made the night wings whole, having bound them together. They remained.
And that was Pyre, everyone. Oh my god. What a journey. I definitely think this is my favorite of the Super Giant games by far. True Nightwing Campaign Unlocked. Press Escape to return to the main menu. True Nightwing? I I think that's probably like a difficulty level or something. Oh, God. <laughs> this normal is hard enough. Yeah. I might have a little bit of fun on my own later with maybe a... Probably not that one, but maybe a slightly harder one. But damn, if this isn't a gorgeous game. <laughs> And there's one thing that I kind of noticed, because I've listened to the soundtrack, and the ending song that we got was slightly different than the one that's like on the main OST. And I've seen this video that I've never watched because, you know, I was worried about heavy spoilers, but it's, it's called something like, How Pyre Sings Your Story. And I've, I have noticed this, that I'm pretty sure... It's not huge changes, but, like, depending on who you liberate, depending on, like, what relationships form and how well you're able to uh, repair some, that, yeah, like, certain parts of that ending song will change. And that's that's pretty amazing. Yeah. (laughs) Because they must have, yeah, they must have put a lot of thought into that. And some of the other songs that they play. Like, I don't know if if I brought this up during the the recording at all, but, for example, every every triumvirate had a song, like, a leitmotif of of the song that plays during the liberation rites, which had its own lyrics. And, man, like, I feel there's a lot more that I really want to say, but we've been recording for a while, so... Thank you, everyone, for joining on joining us on this, and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, it was a good game. Yeah. Well, see you on the next one. See ya.